art uh, session. Uh, next speaker is Professor Christian Klassen. Uh, Christian got PhD in 2006 from TU Munich and habilitated in 2012 in University class in Austria. And since 2014, he led up to two professor in University of uh, Duisburg, Essen. And today he will talk about convex recognition of discrete valued inverse problem. Thank you very much, Schwein, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and giving me a chance to present my work here in this famous and wonderful institute. Not quite, yeah. So the idea of my talk is a certain extremal direction of regularization, an idea of how to bring in very, very strong a priori information and make the most use of it. So the idea is that, in a nutshell, you have an inverse problem for a distributed parameter system where you know the values of the unknown coefficient, but you don't know where the values are supposed to be taken. So this is a discrete information. You don't have a range of values, but you have a finite set of discrete possible values, and you try to distribute them in the optimal way possible. And the idea is how to do this in the convex setting so you can get an efficient and not a global combinatorial optimization method to work for it. And this is joint work with uh, Jam Do in Essen, my PhD student, and the last part is joint work with Florian Kruse and Karl Kunisch, colleagues from Graz, whom I'm still collaborating on this. So the point of the talk is the following. You have, if you have, look at this classical Tikhonov type regularization for an inverse problems, where f is a sort of discrepancy term measuring the mismatch between your model output and the noisy data. You're trying to minimize this, of course, but not um, without any constraints. Namely, you want to have, of course, a Tikhonov term that gives you well posedness, something that you know restricts your minimization to pre-compact um, manifolds, basically. And so this is classical Tikhonov regularization. But in addition, you know that your parameter u, the unknown thing you try to recover should take values only from a finite set u1 to ud. So it's a distributed function, but the values are constrained to live in a discrete set. So these could be, for example, material parameters, if you think of topology optimization or medical imaging, background, healthy tissue, cancerous tissue, or concrete steel, um, defective steel, that sort of thing. Assume you have very, very strong a priori knowledge, and you try to bring this into the um, optimization problem into the Tikhonov regularization problem. And the whole idea of this talk is how to make this work without breaking the rest. So the, the problem, of course, is that this here is a non-convex set. So you're minimizing a functional over a non-convex set. So immediately, the standard theory of existence, optimality conditions, and so on is no longer applicable because it's basically no longer lower semi-continuous. So you might have a minimizer of this functional, but it will not lie in the set. So that's the idea um, that you're trying to get rid of. So as I said, the problem is it's non-convex. So the standard idea is to make it convex. If it doesn't fit, you take a hammer and you make it fit. And this is well known. So this is a standard idea. You have a non-convex functional. You, repla you replace the non-convexity by the convex hull. So the discrete set, if I take the convex hull of this, this is, of course, just the interval between the extremal values, right? So for two different materials, in particular for binary materials, 0 and 1, this is well known. So this is the standard thing you do in topology optimization with two materials, 0 material and material. And there it works nicely. In the optimal control community, this is also known as bang-bang control, because you can show under some very general assumptions that actually the solution, minimizing this functional without this term here over this set, 0, 1, will give you solutions that lie on the extremal points. It will be only 0, lower bang, or only 1, upper bang, and nothing in between except on a singular set. So this is called a bang-bang control because it goes from the bottom to the top over the time. And the idea here is basically to try to follow this recipe, but not with two materials, but with more materials, with an arbitrary number of intermediate stage. And you see immediately what goes wrong here, because in the convexified constraint, the intermediate values no longer appear. So minimizing over this completely loses the information about the intermediate states. So in the case that you have more than two materials, you need to do something different. And the whole idea here 
is to take a page out of the linear optimization or sparsity optimization playbook by trying to promote this um, attainment of the intermediate values by adding a pointwise penalty, which is convex. So at every point, I add some convex function, which should, when optimizing, prefer these given values. So the, the goal is to design this G so that this holds. And as I said, we're taking, as a starting point, the well-known sparsity minimization, where you take the L1 norm. The idea is you have a piecewise linear or piecewise affine function with kinks where the desired values are. So the idea is you have a, let's say, quadratic tracking term and a piecewise affine regularization term. And, this, and of course, you try to make both small. And what you would normally do is to try to go away from one of these discrete given values to make the tracking term smaller, to get, go closer to the data. So it's quadratic, so a small step will give you a quadratically small increment or decrement of the, regular, of the discrepancy term. While this term here will be linear, so the corresponding ascent in the regularization term will be more. So it will be more expensive to go from away from these given values just to make the discrepancy term a little bit smaller. And in the end, that means the solution would like to lie in these um, sets everything else being equal. And you have the same sort of structure in, in linear optimization where you minimize a linear functional subject to polyhedral constraints where everybody knows a solution is always attained on the boundary of the set. There's the same principle here. Sorry, not just on the boundary, but on the, at a corner of the admissible set. And these going towards corners is exactly what happens here. I should say that is, I'm of course losing something by convexifying this result, but we will talk about what we can still show later on. So this is, for example, one um, possible choice of this um, polyhedral regularization term. So u1, u2, u3 are the given uh, desired values, and you design something piecewise affine so that it has kinks in the desired states. And as I said, it comes from convexification. So in this case, this is the convex envelope of the quadratic norm, the regularization term, plus the indicator function of the discrete, the non-convex constraint, meaning this term is zero if u is equal to one of these ui, one to ud, or infinity else. So if I minimize this, this would be exactly what I was trying to minimize on the first slide, which I can't. And if I take the convex hull of this functional, I get exactly this. And since it's a generalization of bang-bang control, I like to call it multi-bang control, so just to give it a name. And of course, now you have a distributed parameter with a non-differential term that kings necessarily make the problem non-differentiable. So you have to solve this to compute a minimizer of this Tichonov functional. You need to do a non-smooth optimization function spaces, which is what I like to do. So this is why I'm interested in this problem. So I thought this overview being done, what I'd do is to talk you through the whole strategy of solving these convex problems in function space. So the keywords here are convex analysis to derive optimality conditions, which are useful. Um, apply a regularization or a smoothing, which is just enough to make the problem amenable to generalized Newton methods, which are much faster in practice than, let's say, first order methods or fixed point iterations. And then I would like to go through the whole general idea at the in the specific case of the multibank penalty to just go through the steps to see how, how this works in this case. In the third part of the talk, I would like to talk a bit about the regularization properties. So the idea is that we replace the Tichonov term squared norm times alpha by this convex um, multibank penalty and see if this still has some regularization properties or if I need some additional regularization to make it work. And of course, it's a convex term. We know that this works since Martin Burger's work, um, but there are th some nice things you can say in this specific setting because you have a very specific structure of the regularization term. And then tell you a bit about why I think this actually promotes the desired structure. And time permitting, I would like to then go towards actually nonlinear problems, EIT-type problems, and, and what changes there. 
Okay, so this is convex analysis in a nutshell, all you need to know. We're trying to minimize a functional that you know, is defined on some Banach space with possibly the value infinity, say, meaning that these are values which we do not want to see in our optimization, these are excluded. So this is a way of treating constrained optimization in a sort of unconstrained formalism. That's, that's the nice thing about this. And of course, if, it's not, if it has kings, it's not differentiable, so you need a sort of generalized derivative. And it turns out that these are the so-called convex subdifferentials. These are set valued. This is the price you pay. And they're defined in, this follow, in the following way. You take a V star in the dual space because simply you need to multiply it uh, with an element of the space itself. So this variational inequality here characterizes the subdifferential, And it's easiest to see if you move this term to the left-hand side. You're sitting in one V bar, and then you take a fi finite value F of V bar plus something with a slope V star and an increment V minus V bar. So this is, if you put this onto the left-hand side, this is just an F-fine functional that um, touches the graph of F at V bar, so this is a tangent to F at V bar. So what the subdifferential is, is the set of slopes of all possible tangents to the function at this point. And of course, if the function is differentiable, there's only one tangent, there's one tangent whose slope gives you the, the derivative. This is how you motivate in a first year calculus class derivatives. If, it's, if you have a kink, it's no longer unique. You have several possible tangents and all possible slopes are in the set. And you can see immediately what happens if zero is in the set, if you have a horizontal slope, then this term here just drops out. V star is zero, so this is zero. So you have v, f of v bar is less or equal than f of v for any v, so you're at a global minimizer. So by construction, zero in the set means you're in a global minimizer. This is the nice thing about this set. And there's, the other nice thing is that there's a lot of calculus rules. You have some rules, you have chain rules to actually compute these sets. And one of the most useful and specific to convex analysis is this so-called Fenchel conjugate that takes an element of the dual space and maps it to this supremum. The, there's two things I can say about this which probably help. One thing is, if you compare these two definitions, you can see that they will play nicely together. So they fit together very well. And if you look at this a bit harder, you can see that it takes something that acts like a slope and maps it to something in the, um, something that looks like an offset. So what this does is, if you give me a slope V star, then this F star will tell you how much you have to shift a linear function with that slope so it becomes a tangent, right? So this maps a slope to the necessary offset for it to become a tangent. And again, tangents are, tangent slopes are in here, so you get something that plays nicely. And you can see this in the so-called convex inverse function theorem, namely that if you have a slope, a tangent slope at a certain point, this point is in the sub, is so-called, is, is a tangent slope for the, con, for the Fenchel conjugate. So the subdifferential of the conjugate is the inverse function of the subdifferential of the original function, right? So if you have an inclusion like this, you can equivalently write it li like this, and hopefully this will give you something nicer to work with. So immediately you can play with these sorts of things to get something nicer. So in, in practice, of course, you're not minimizing a function, you're minimizing the sum of two functionals, a discrepancy term and a realization term. F will be the standard discrepancy term. G will now be our multibank penalty. So as I said, this, minimizing this is equivalent to looking for a point where you have a horizontal tangent, where zero is in this set of the sum. So of course you have to pay a price. The sum rule is not automatic. You have to have some sort of regularity condition, but if you have this, you can split this set into the Minkowski sum of two sets, meaning zero is in the sum of these sets, which is just all possible sums of elements of this set and this set. So there has to be one element in the first set, so that minus this element is in the second set, so that they sum to zero, right? And this is what you see here. There's a sort of Lagrange multiplier, if you will, such that it's, you can split this optimality condition in this way, and if you then apply this inverse function theorem to the second line, you get something of this sort, which is like a primal dual optimality condition. 
And for example, this, if you want to do numerical methods, one way you could do this is you start with a U0, you pick an element from the subdifferential, you get a P0, plug it in here, get a new U1, and iterate, and this would be a very simple fixed point iteration. It will not converge in general because subgradients are not descent directions, so you need to be a bit smarter, but this, te I mean, this tells you that this is something that can be of use. Okay. But we don't want to do a fixed point iteration, we want to do a Newton type method, and for this we need to go from these set valid inclusions to something that looks like an equation. Newton's methods solve equations, so we need to go to an equation. And one standard way of going to that direction is to look at the so-called proximal mapping, which is nicely defined in Hilbert spaces as the minimizer of this convex problem, uh, functional plus a quadratic functional, right? So this is convex. This is a quadratic norm, so it's strictly convex, so the minimizer is unique. So this proximal mapping takes an element, P, and maps it to something like a local quadratic approximation of the function graph. Right? And so this makes it immediately single valued. So this gives you some replacement of the, of the subgradient which you can't work with. And you can also show that this is Lipschitz continuous as a function of P. And for people working with monotone operators, you might know this as the resolvent. And this is actually one way of computing this as the pre-image of the set-valued mapping. And if you know the classical primal dual methods, forward-backward splitting, douglas Rashford splitting, or the chambol poc method, you know these operators as the, the standard ingredient needed to make these methods work. Okay, we want to do Newton methods. So we take this proximal mapping and use it to reformulate our non-smooth optimality condition. So it's a simple algebraic reformulation, which we've already seen in the talk by Robert Plato, um, that this in in inclusion holds if and only this equality holds for any gamma greater than zero. It's a completely equivalent formulation. You just add some terms to both sides, apply the definition of the resolvent, and you get this. So this is a single valid equation in principle. This is now an equation you would like to apply Newton's method to. It's Lipschitz continuous, which means a generalized Newton method might work. But the problem is that it's implicit, which means that U is on both sides. So this is an implicit equation in U, which is what you're interested in. And this is a problem if you are actually working in function spaces. So you'd like to get rid of the U on the right-hand side. And luckily, this is a standard operation, which is known as the moro regularization. If you just take the right-hand side without any u, this coincides with the moro regularization of the subdifferential of this g star here. So this now, u is the subdifferential of g star gamma at p, is now an equation, which is Lipschitz continuous with Lipschitz constant 1 over gamma. It's single valid. It's explicit because u only appears on the left-hand side. But of course, it's no longer equivalent. I've, made, I've dropped something, so I made an error. But you can show that this goes to zero as gamma goes to zero, simply by a standard calculus showing what I'm doing here is replacing g by g plus a quadratic norm. Right? So this is an additional uh, convexification of the original problem. I'm not smoothing the problem. I'm just replacing it by something that is strictly convex as opposed to just convex. And this turns the conjugate differentiable. That's, that's a nice thing. So now I can do this as a non-smooth operator equation which works with Newton's method. So in our context, I'm trying to minimize or find the root of a local Lipschitz piecewise differentiable functional. And for real valid functions, this has been known for a long time, since the late 70s. Kummer, Mifflin worked on this a lot. Basically what it turns out is that these functions here, they have a nice generalized derivative in the sense of Clark, which means the limit points of all possible Jacobians of the function f. And any possible selection of this um, can be taken as a linear operator in a Newton-like method to make this converge locally superlinearly. So basically, this in this specific setting is the convex hull of piecewise derivatives, where I'm differentiable. I just take the standard derivative. And where two pieces meet, and I'm in a kink, I can take the convex hull of the derivative from the left and from the right, and any selection from the set will do the trick, basically because it's very unlikely that Newton's method will go from kink to kink to kink, and if you hit a kink once in a while, Newton's method won't care. So this is basically the 
the intuition. So now we're looking for functions. There, things are a bit more complicated. In a long time, nobody knew how to do this. But it turns out there's a very nice theory due to Michael Ulbrich, well, actually, Ori, uh, Chen, Nashet, and Chi um, did this. There's a, if you have the same function I had before, but you define a superposition or Nimitzki operator defined on it by simply applying this scalar function to the value of a, of a function. This is an operator ma mapping functions to functions. And it turns out you can do the same thing with any measurable selection of the formula just by applying this theory pointwise. And the price you have to pay is that this operator has to have a norm gap. Basically, what you put into f has to be smoother than you take out. It's exactly the same theory and exactly the same proof as for Nimitzki operators. Frege differentiability of superposition operators in Lebesgue spaces requires exactly the same condition, and the proofs are pretty much identical. So the idea is, you, and this is why you needed the regularization, why, the, why you couldn't have an implicit equation if you solve for u, and it's on both sides. You have to take this from LP to LP. There's no norm gap. You cannot apply this theory. But if, if you take P and P is smoother than U, then this works. And this is kind of a running gag of this whole theory that a lot of these things you can do pointwise. If you have something that is like a pointwise penalty, like the multibank penalty, acting on the values of a function and then integrating, all this convex, function, convex analysis, regularization, semi-smooth Newton theory goes through pointwise. So basically, you can compute all the operators you need, subdifferential, conjugate subdifferential, proximal mapping, regularization, Newton derivative, simply for scalar functions. It's paint by numbers. Any undergraduate student with a bit of frustration tolerance can do this for you. And then in the end, you apply the heavy machinery of you know, measurable selections and so on to show that this works also for these superposition operators. So and this is basically the the procedure which we will now follow for specifically the case of the multibank penalty. So if you compute the convex harm, um, which is not too hard, you can see that this looks like this. So this is a piecewise linear between two desired states. You have something with a slope of 1 over 2 times the sum of these. So the average of the two values is the slope minus an offset to make it continuous. And since you're interested in something between u1 and ud, you just cut off the rest. So anything smaller than u1 or larger than ud, you set to infinity. OK, so this is exactly the, the thing I showed you, a piecewise differentiable, piecewise continuously differentiable continuous function. So the generalized derivative is the convex hull of the piecewise derivative. So it's either if you're in the interior of the set, which is this line, it's exactly the slope here. It's single valued. And where these two meet at u1 or u2 or u3, you take the convex hull of these averages. And you immediately see this is the single valued case. This is nice. This is the set valued case. This is nasty. OK, and the convex inverse function theorem just tells you to go from this subdifferential to this, which appears in the prime and dual optimality conditions. You just replace these two sets. So instead of having this set in this point, you have this point when you're in the set. And so you immediately see the values are exactly the given values unless you're at this specific value in the argument where you have exactly this average slope. So there's only a single, singular set with finite values for this Q where you have a problem. Otherwise, you're nice. Remember the, the optimality conditions where U, what you're actually looking for, is pointwise in the subdifferential of this G star. So almost everywhere, it will have the desired values. So this tells you that you're actually on the right track here. So for a picture to see how this looks, so this is for a very simple um, choice of desired values. This multibank penalty, this is, of course, the, the subdifferential. The derivative here is constant, here is constant, and here you take the convex hull, here it's set valued. And then you flip, go from here to here. By the inverse function theorem, you just flip the, it along the um, the diagonal, you get this. And again here, 0, 1, 2 are the desired values. And at these two values, here you could take something in between. Here you might not have the desired structure. So this is the, the case which you need to investigate. OK, so this is the non-differentiable part here. Everything here is nice. This is the nasty part. So the main idea is basically, instead of having a set at a point, 
you shift things slightly to have a linear function on a set. So you replace this by something which is nice, exactly the, the original value, in a slightly smaller set. This is a slightly smaller set than before. And this gives you room to, namely this set, where you can put in a linear function or an affine function of slope one over gamma. And as gamma goes to zero, these become, of course, steeper and steeper until you meet the set value case. So this now is, sorry, and this here is the thing which we plug into our optimality conditions to make it differentiable, Newton differentiable. Okay, so with these tools in hand, let's go towards the regularization. So standard linear inverse problem, you have a linear forward mapping from L2 to some data space Y, which I'm assuming is weakly closed. So if you have a weakly convergent series sequence UN and a weakly converging sequence YN, uh, such that YN is equal to KUN, the limit points will, be, will satisfy KU is equal to Y. And you have a given noisy data with a noise level of delta and given parameter values D greater than two. And G now, this regularization term here is exactly our multiband penalty. Okay, so it's a convex penalty. Everything is nice. There's nothing we have to do. Standard theory tells us that this is well posed. You have a solution for every alpha greater than zero. It's stable for every alpha greater than zero, meaning if the noise level goes to zero, the reconstructions converge to the reconstructions for exact data. And if you have the standard um, alpha goes to zero with delta, but not too quickly, you have convergence in the, in the combined sequence as alpha and, sorry, as delta and alpha goes to zero. The reconstructions can work, converge weakly to U dagger. You can do the same thing with rates under the standard source condition. This is also well known in the convex case, either under a priori choice or a posteriori choice, the Morris of discrepancy principle. And you get the standard convergence rate in Breckman distance, which is something that kind of metrizes intermediate or strict convergence. So it tells you you have convergent, weak convergence for a fixed subgradient here, and you have convergence of the function values, and this tells you how this converges to zero. And this gap here converges to zero with a linear rate, um, simply because this here is a replacement for the norm squared in a Hilbert space, right? So this be in a Hilbert space, if you have a squared norm here, this behaves like the distance of u1 and u2 squared. So you would e expect this to go to zero as delta. So this is completely standard. Not so standard is this slide, which is basically the, the main novelty here. Because you have a very specific pointwise characterization of your functional, you have the same specific pointwise characterization of the Breckman distance, and you can use this characterization to get additional information. If you look at this pointwise, if you have an exact solution which actually attains one of these desired values, and you take a subgradient which is not in this critical set, then you can show that the Breckman distance goes to zero as delta goes to zero, pointwise. And if this is not the case, if your exact data is not one of the known values, then the Breckman distance is zero, no matter, as long as you're in the right interval of the desired values, right? So this tells you nothing if the exact solution doesn't have the desired structure. Well, you still have weak convergence, but you don't get any pointwise information. And plugging, putting these two together tells you if your exact solution actually comes from this desired set, if you guess correctly, you have pointwise and hence strong solution a convergence, which is not something you usually have in convex regularization theory. But this, of course, here is something that is not uniform with X, so this uh, it's basically an argument by contradiction. So that means you don't get any rates that are pointwise. Only convergence, but without rates, but still. Okay. I've said most of this already, so I'll be very quickly here. So this is the optimality system you get. The discrepancy term is quadratic, this differentiable, so you get a single-valued equation here. This is the standard backpropagated residual. You plug it into this multibang subdifferential, and you see that your desired solution u bar is one of these desired values if and only if the, the backpropagated residual does not attain these exceptional values on a set of measure greater than zero. 
So if you can, for example, exclude that this p here, the, that the range of k star is piecewise constant on open sets, unless the right-hand side is zero, then you can exclude this case a priori and you know that you are perfect, and then you can actually show that this is an exact relaxation of the non-convex penalty, right? So if you can exclude this set, these optimality conditions are the necessary and sufficient optimality conditions for the original non-convex discrete regularization. And for example, for an inverse problem, for a pure second order elliptic equation, this is the case. The solution is a harmonic function. It cannot be zero on an open set unless the right-hand side is, it cannot be constant on an open set unless the right-hand side is zero. Okay, and then you do the same trick I told you. You replace the inclusion by the Lipschitz continuous explicit equality. This will make it um, Lipschitz continuous with a norm gap due to um, the smoothing properties of K star. Then you can do an inverse source, uh, then you can do a Newton method. There are some tricks you can do for inverse source problems specifically by using this inverse operator, putting this on the right hand side, eliminating U to solve for P and Y, basically to make this a symmetric Newton system. And if you compare this with the standard Tikhonov regularization, the only difference is this lower block here, which would be minus identity, sorry, minus alpha times the identity for the Tikhonov regularization. And here, this is my minus a diagonal matrix with a zero or one over gamma on the diagonal. So you get an active set type strategy. And this is very nice because it tells you that this thing here does not really depend on the number of intermediate states. You could have two, 500, 1,000 pre-specified values. The only thing that um, this affects is this case distinction here. There's a bit of bookkeeping to see which of these um, whether you have to actually take one over gamma or zero. There's some cases you have to test and that's all. So this, the size of the system and the condition number of the system is not influenced by the number of, of desired states. And this is completely different from a mixed integer type approach for these non-convex things. Okay, for a simple linear inverse problem, uh, inverse source problem for the Laplace operator with three given parameter values, zero, 1.1, 1 .1, or either 1.1, Zero, sorry, 0 0.15 or 0 0.11, so 50% contrast or 10% contrast for an inner inclusion, given noise, uh, and looking for the Morozov discrepancy principle for alpha. This is what you get, so this is the exact solution, background, healthy tissue, unhealthy tissue, and this is the regularization you get for the discrepancy principle with very large noise, so this is the price you have to pay. Contrast might get lost because it's, for a large alpha, it's cheaper to look at the lower magnitude values. So this is what you see here. It's cheaper to ignore this part than this part. But other than that, you have exactly the right, um, um, the right values which you put into. So you have a con guaranteed contrast between the background and the inclusion. There's no smooth thing. You have a very sharp interface here. And of course, if you reduce delta, alpha will get smaller and you get the reconstruction until you get a perfect reconstruction. The same thing works with uh, less contrast for the inner inclusion. Again, large noise, large regularization, the inner inclusion is lost and then it co comes back and you get again convergence. So it's a guaranteed contrast. You enforce the contrast. If it's there, it has to be that. This is what you get out of this. An interesting thing is what happens if you don't have as I said, the correct value. So here the inner inclusion, it's hard to see, is not constant, but linear or affine, right? So this is something which does not, so here you have pointwise, here you expect pointwise convergence, but here not. Here you only expect weak convergence, and you actually see this, large noise, large alpha gives you something, and if you decrease delta and get a smaller alpha, you get something that is known as a chittering or chattering phenomenon. You get these os heavy oscillations on the set where you only have weak convergence, but not pointwise convergence. So this is exactly what you see for a sequence that converges weakly, but not pointwise. But of course, it still converges if the noise goes away and you reduce alpha, you converge to something that is visually indistinguishable from this. Okay, I do have two minutes for non, five minutes, okay, that's very generous. Five minutes including questions, so I'll be brief anyway. There's not much you can say here. If you have a nonlinear mapping, 
which is week to week continuous, meaning maps weekly converging sequences to weekly converging sequences. And for a G-differentiable, you can do the same thing. For example, the solution mapping to this PDE, where you're looking for the lower order coefficient from measurements on, on the solution Y, you can do the same thing. Now, of course, the tracking term involves this linearized adjoint equation here. Uh, but this here is exactly the same, and the whole structure goes through exactly the same. Now, of course, the Newton method requires some invertibility of the Newton matrix. This becomes more technical to verify this. But it's, again, pined by numbers. And you can see this basically, well, this is the noise data, not so interesting. Um, this is the exact solution, and this is the, the reconstruction. So you, you have the same thing. But, and this is the important thing, it's a purely pointwise penalty. So there's no spatially, <coughs> spatial regularity imposed by the regularization. So this is only a value-based regularization, but not a spatial regularization. So you, the only regularity you get of the reconstruction is the regularity of the adjoint state, which is mapped through pointwise through this conjugate multibank penalty. So the nicer the P, the nicer the U, and everybody knows if I take this here, the solution is no longer y, but y times p. Uh, which, so, so this p is the solution of this equation, pointwise multiplied by the solution of this equation. And this has lower regularity, and you can see this here. So the, the regularity of p is now much lower than before. And you can see these, well, the level sets are much less nice. So this, of course, tells you I want nice level sets. What do I do with nice level sets? I do BV regularization, which I already know if I want to go to the more interesting case of this EIT type problem, where I'm looking for the principal component in an elliptic PDE. The problem is this is not a weakly closed operator, so I might, so minimizing a Tikhonov term will give me an optimal state and an optimal coefficient, but they don't satisfy this PDE anymore. They are linked by a sort of averaged PDE. So you need to do something differently. So you need a bit more regularity, either of u or of y. And one way of is smoothing this PDE. That works, but it's cheating. Or you can add total variation regularization. We take the Rado norm of the distributional gradient. And this is something that will also penalize the length of the, or the, of the perimeter of characteristic functions. So you would hope that this nasty, irregular surface goes away. So this looks like a nice idea. Immediately you run into troubles because these regularity conditions, which you need, as I said, in the beginning to apply the sum rule are no longer satisfied. So a lot of technical things, and I probably should be um, quick now. The problem is that these are three non-smooth terms of which you cannot make finite two of them. So you need to get rid of one of the terms, and it turns out that you can rid get rid of this indicator function by replacing the coefficient in the PDE by a projection. So you just cut off everything outside of this interval. So instead, you have this cut off, which you might have a small smoothing for. And then it turns out everything works nicely if you do a bit, a bit of work. You have a different, you have existence and differentiability of the mapping of U to this, um, to this state Y. And we've heard this before in the talk um, before the break. We can use Meyer's, Meyer's regularity results to get a bit more regularity of the solution of the state equation and the adjoint equation, which gives us something that is in LR for R greater than 1. And this is crucial to have this additional regularity to make this convex analysis work in the right spaces, which means that you can actually write down this primal dual optimality conditions in a way that allows you to characterize these things pointwise. Right? So you again get this nice pointwise characterization of the subdifferential that tells you almost everywhere you are in the correct value. And something here which is a bit more involved but tells you that this chi is something of like the mean curvature of the, of the level sets of the function u. And after discretization and regularization, this can still be solved with a Newton method. Of course, this is hard work. Um, and this is what you get. So this is, for this EIT-like problem, the reconstruction with multibank but no TV. And you can see immediately the very, very low regularity you get of this adjoint state. There's no spatial smoothness. And if you include the total variation penalty, you get something 
which is a much better reconstruction. So these values here are much pretty close to the exact value. You get some smoothing at the at the edges, which I'm trying to get rid of, but it's a much, much better reconstruction. Okay, and with this I would like to close. I'm not reading, I'm not going to read off the slide. I hope I could convince you that this works and is fun to do and could be useful to some of you in a somewhat bizarre set of circumstances. And there's of course much more to do. The Morozov parameter choice rule was much too pessimistic. It over smooth and I'm trying to get rid of this by a heuristic parameter choice rule. And of course, this is a toy example. It's not proper EIT. I've had distributed data. So this is the next step to work with actual EIT data. Samuli's um, open EIT data set will be very, very useful here. And if you want to know more, the papers and the codes are on my webpage. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions.